Coyne and all versus Scott Walker at all. I will see the 4573 appearances, please. Good morning, Your Honor. This is uh, Susan Crawford. I am from Pine Spot in Madison, and I'm appearing on behalf of Plaintiffs Coin et al. Your Honor, my name is Randall Gershinsky. I'm with WEAC, Wisconsin Education Association Council. Also with me is Christina Riley, also with Wisconsin <coughs> Education Council, and we are also appearing on behalf of the Plaintiffs Coin et al. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Your Honor. Uh, ben Jones appearing for uh, the State Superintendent Tony Evers and the Department of Public Construction. Assistant AG Timothy Barber and DOJ Senior Counsel Dan Lennington appearing on behalf of Defendant Scott Walker and Secretary Mitzel. All right, we're here on oral argument that was requested back on January 31 relating to the order to show cause that was issued earlier by <coughs> Judge Mitchell. Um, I have read all of the briefs uh, and evidentiary materials submitted before and against the motion by all parties. I've read the Supreme Court uh, decision. Issued back in uh, 2000. I think it was 16 or 15, whenever it was. And um, I'm prepared to hear your argument. Ms. Crawford, who, will all of you be arguing, or is it going to just be you? Or, I, I will be arguing. Not just you, but I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'll be arguing on behalf of uh, plaintiffs. All right. Thank you, point out. And then, uh, Mr. Garzinski, do you anticipate arguing as well? No, I'm here to cheer with you, Your Honor. All right. Well, uh, you forgot your pom poms, but uh, go ahead, Ms. Crawford. I will have a voice, Your Honor. You we may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, as the court just uh, stated, we're here on uh, order to show cause uh, signed by Judge Mitchell back on December 1st, uh, 2017. And uh, uh, our position is that the defendants, Walker, um, and Mitzel have not demonstrated cause uh, to stand in the way of the court granting the supplemental relief requested by the petitioners. Uh, they have uh, offered no argument or no position on the underlying merits presented in that petition, which are that uh, Act 57 did not uh, Cure the constitutional defects that the Supreme Court found as applied to the Superintendent of Public Instruction and DPI rulemaking in uh, Wisconsin Statute Section 227.135 uh, and 185. Uh, they have asserted uh, jurisdictional objections to the filing of the petition, um, uh, namely, first, that the uh, Petition for Supplemental Relief is untimely uh, because it was filed after the um, judgment, the declaratory judgment and injunction were affirmed by the Wisconsin Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals. Uh, there is really no authority uh, that they can cite that would support that proposition. Uh, the statute, which is found at 806.04 sub 8, uh, grants the circuit court broad authority to grant supplemental relief whenever it's necessary or proper um, and to do so after giving reasonable notice uh, to the adverse party um, to show cause why further relief has, uh, should not be granted. Uh, the uh, defendants Walker and Neitzel have had such opportunity. They've been given reasonable notice it's been uh, something over two months uh, since they were presented with the petition and order to show cause. They have not shown it. Well, let me ask you this. Yes. If I don't enter the relief you request, what's going to happen? What is the threat to Judge Smith's uh, declaration and uh, injunction? Well, the... Not what you fear is going to happen, but what is actually going to happen? What is the... Uh, mm -hmm. What's a uh, credible actual threat to mm -hmm. what she has done? Mm -hmm. Well, both the Attorney General and the Governor's spokesperson have now stated that uh, Superintendent Evers' 
uh, and the DPI are in violation of state law by not complying with uh, Act 57, which they refer to as the Women's Act. Um, but and they've been saying that all along, right? I mean, they said that before Judge Smith entered her declaration and judgment. They Right, except that the RAINS Act, the Act 57 didn't exist at that time. So what they're arguing is that because there has been legislative action since the Supreme Court issued that decision, that now, <coughs> as of today, the superintendent and DPI are in violation of state law. And so what, all right, so they, why isn't that just pure political speech? Well, the, um, it may also be political speech, but the, um, the Declaratory Judgment Act, the purposes of the Uniform Declaratory Judgment Act are to afford uh, parties uh, relief from uncertainty. There is substantial uncertainty now on the part of the superintendent and DPI as to whether they are in compliance with state law in light of the Attorney General statements and the Governor's statements that they are not in compliance with state law and they are entitled under the Declaratory Judgment Act to have relief from that uncertainty. Uh, the, the law of the Uniform Declaratory Judgment Act states that it has to be liberally construed and administered in accordance with those purposes. So there does not need to be, contrary to what Walker and Governor Walker and, and Mitzel are, are stating, there does not have to be some imminent threat that somebody is going to come after uh, Superintendent Evers or, or the DPI with some kind of enforcement action or, um, or otherwise. I, I think the court is aware that there's a petition pending in the Wisconsin Supreme Court on which no action has been taken at this point. Uh, but there is certainly the potential for other parties to uh, um, uh, undertake legal action uh, in reliance on the Attorney General and Governor's position that the superintendent is now in violation of the law. For example, the superintendent has, uh, is currently engaging in rulemaking related to uh, teacher licensing and, and certification. Is he intending um, to submit either a scope, a, a statement scope, or a regulation to Governor Walker? He is not, and well, has then, not. And, and how is Governor Walker or any uh, of the uh, respondents, defendants here in any position to violate the injunction? It may not be them, Your Honor. It may be that after this rulemaking um, is completed that we have um, other parties, such as, as teachers. Well, isn't that the point in time that I should step in if there, if there is an actual credible threat to the uh, dec declaratory judgment and injunction that's been previously entered, if there's some threat that there's actually going to be some violation of it? as opposed to, well, this may happen. I mean, that all, there, there's always a potential that somebody is going to not follow a declaratory judgment action. That's always a potential, but we don't always come back to court on the fear that that might happen in order to uh, get further relief. I think it's a pretty unusual situation where you have the Attorney General, who is uh, you know, charged with enforcing the law of the state, and also the Governor, who is also charged with enforcing the law of the state, accusing the superintendent of public instruction of not following the law. And that, we believe, is sufficient to invoke this court's jurisdiction under the supplemental relief provision of the Uniform Declaratory Judgment Act. There is ample case law uh, stating that there does not need to be an imminent threat of enforcement action for a party to seek relief and to seek um, some uh, repose as to where there is uncertainty as to uh, his or her legal rights under the Uniform Declaratory Judgment Act. And he has that word uncertainty history. twice. Is Superintendent Ebert, has he ever stated that he was uncertain about his authority here? Well, he believes that his legal position is correct. Correct. So he's he's not, never said there, that he was uncertain about that. That is correct. But the uncertainty is that he is saying one thing and the governor and the attorney general are now saying precisely the opposite. And those were the parties aligned in opposition in the previous coin case. So the dispute has been resurrected by the Attorney General and the Governor, and our position is that that is sufficient to invoke the court's uh, supplemental uh, authority to grant supplemental relief here, and the, the relief that we're requesting is for the court to um, 
uh, declare, uh, pursuant to the Declaratory Judgment Act, <coughs> Act 57, those new provisions, did not alter, amend, repeal, or otherwise cure the statutory provisions that were declared to be unconstitutional as applied to the superintendent and the department in the coin decision. It is the attorney general and the governor that have resurrected or attempted to resurrect that dispute through their public statements, and the superintendent is entitled to resolve that uncertainty in the eyes of the public. You know, he's also an elected public official, and for him to be out there administering uh, his his constitutional authority in the face of other constitutional officers saying he's violating the law is um, uh, very problematic. Uh, he's but it happens all the time in the political arena, doesn't it? Where, um, for example, the courts do something and Governor Walker says it's uh, uh, against the law what we're doing. Or the um, attorney general is, uh, or some uh, legislator is arguing this that some legislation that's been passed is unconstitutional and they'll challenge it in the courts. Or uh, the governor says he'll challenge uh, things in the court. That's a political question. I think that after there has been a decision uh, rendered by the, the highest state courts and subsequent, I, I, I think there are just some unique facts here. And, and, and perhaps there are other circumstances where someone, a, an elected state official, has made an <coughs> accusation against another public uh, state official about the way they are executing their duties under state law, and that official has not uh, uh, sought the relief of a court. That's not to say that they couldn't. It's just to say that they probably haven't in every instance. The issue here is whether the court has the jurisdiction to grant the requested authority. And I think it is plain on the face of the statute under 80604-8 that this court does have that authority. Well, I don't think I, there's any doubt that I have authority. I don't think there's any doubt that, uh, uh, notwithstanding the uh, competent arguments of uh, uh, defense counsel, um, I don't think there's any doubt that uh, the passage of time is irrelevant for the whole uh, analysis. If the declaratory judgment or injunction entered by Judge Smith and affirmed twice by the Court of Appeals and once by the, or twice, twice in the appellate system. If those are threatened, then I can step in and, and render orders that are necessary and proper to make sure those orders are followed. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a problem with that. My concern is the language of the statute that says wherever necess whenever necessary. Mm -hmm. Why is it necessary when there has been no threat that they are going to violate the injunction or the declaration. They have basically just said, we believe it's illegal, we're going to the Supreme Court to see whether or not we're correct. Well, it, it undermines the superintendent's constitutional authority is one thing, and it also undermines the, the integrity of the court system to have them out there arguing that a previous decision by the Wisconsin Supreme Court is somehow no longer valid because the legislature has enacted a new piece of legislation that in fact does not affect the uh, provisions that have been declared on Constitution. So you want me to do this to protect the Supreme Court? Yes, the court system. Okay. And, and the superintendent. So the superintendent is not out there okay. undertaking action that is, you know, under question and being disputed by two of the highest constitutional officers in the state as invalid and without legal authority. Your Honor, if I can add. Yes, sir. For uh, the position of the superintendent, the state superintendent. Right now, uh, the state superintendent of the DPI is issuing rules under the assumption that uh, submitting those rules to the governor would be unconstitutional. The, the, the department is enjoying Or requiring that the governor pass on and be unconstitutional. Absolutely. Right, and that's the law right now. Exactly. So he's right. And so, if, uh, if it turns out that the injunction is no longer in effect, which is what um, my understanding of the Department of Justice's uh, position is, then the rules that are currently uh, being developed are threatened. Uh, Where did they say that, though? I, I saw that in Mr. Krasinski's um, submissions that somewhere the Department of Justice has taken the position <coughs> that the injunction is no longer in effect. Where is right. that in the evidentiary materials? So, uh, a couple sources. Uh, the primary source 
uh, would be the statement uh, in an email to the department that there is no legal basis uh, for the legal conclusion that the Department of Public Instruction uh, is not subject to the RAINS Act. Uh, the RAINS Act, as the um, governor and the Department of Justice is And I saw that, but that's a different thing than saying that the injunction is no longer in effect. Right. Uh, so where is the support for the contention by your folks that the Department of Justice has taken the position that they can ignore the injunction because it is no longer in effect? Right. Uh, a couple uh, pieces of context. One, the response that there is no legal effect uh, or no legal defense to um, non-compliance with the RAINS Act comes in response to the Koshki brief in which uh, the plaintiffs, the petitioners in that case, argue that uh, the RAINS Act is fully operational, fully applicable to the state superintendent including uh, the provisions that require the governor to uh, veto any, or uh, to have the uh, ability or opportunity to veto any rules uh, promulgated by the department. Uh, further, in the, uh, the governor's brief uh, in response to the petition, they refer to uh, having fully complied with the injunction in the past tense. Uh, as Is that true? In, on page two of the defendant's brief, they refer to uh, the defendants have fully complied with the injunction. And my question, is that true? Uh, thus far, they, they have, have complied with the injunction up to the point where they have now taken the position that the RAINS Act uh, effectively nullified the injunction. I well, learned, that, that's where I'm wondering where that support for that argument is. I don't think they said it nullified the injunction. They said that the new law takes precedence and they're going to establish that, but I don't see anywhere in this record that they said they have said that until the Supreme Court says otherwise, we are not going to follow the injunction. The, the basis would be that there, there appears to be no universe in which the RAINS Act applies and is constitutional at the same time that the injunction continues to be in effect. And I think that's the basis for the supplemental relief that's requested is that uh, the, uh, the petitioners are looking for a declaration that the RAINS Act did not uh, modify or materially affect the injunction, um, and that would clarify the superintendent's um, ability to issue rules without seeking Gover uh, Governor Walker's veto um, review. All right, so the injunction and declaration have been followed ever since they've been entered, right? To date. Yes. And there has been no regulation or scope statement submitted uh, to the governor um, since, uh, yeah, currently pending. Correct. And there's n at no point where there has been a statement, we are no longer going to follow the injunction or declaration of this court. That's where um, the statements that we've submitted uh, in our affidavits, that's where we would say uh, the position of the governor appears to be that the injunction is no longer in effect. And, well, and how is the governor going to follow through with that? if no regulations are submitted to him to rule or the, any scope state. If, if Mr. Evers continues in his fully consistent position all along that I don't need to submit these to the governor, continues to do that, how is uh, the governor going to ever violate the injunction? Or how is the Department of Justice going to violate the injunction? One concern is uh, the position taken by uh, the governor that the Department of Public Construction is unable to represent itself in this matter. Well, that's a different issue. I agree that uh, if this thing is accepted by the, the Supreme Court, that there ought to be the representation of uh, Mr. Evers, <coughs> just what the Department of Justice thinks 
is Mr. Eber's position. But that's not before me, right? That's a Supreme Court issue. And my, I have enough confidence in the Supreme Court that they will accept argument from across the board they, if for no other reason that they constantly accept amicus briefs, right? Right. So that's a different issue. I, what happens at the Supreme Court is of no, uh, um, <coughs> it has no bearing on what I'm going to do here. I suppose, and I can't represent the position of the petition, but from uh, the department's perspective, from Superintendent Evers' perspective, the value in the supplemental relief is not necessarily to correct uh, a violation of an injunction previously, but to clarify uh, that the RAINS Act does not materially modify uh, the rulemaking process to preserve uh, the um, defensibility or the, the authenticity or the authority for rulemaking that is ongoing currently. All right. <clears throat> Any further, Ms. Crawford? Um, you know, I just would like to point out a couple of things. One is that uh, <coughs> Walker and Mitzel have presented extensive argument to the effect that the coin decision does not mean anything and that there was no holding in it. Um, which is you know, problematic even outside of the, um, the dispute over Act 57. Uh, they uh, appear to be arguing that uh, there is nothing uh, remaining to comply with because of the way the uh, decision in the point case is structured. So that, again, is, um, is is cause for concern and uncertainty as to what uh, Superintendent Evers and DPI's current legal obligations are. Um, I um, I would also point out that um, the uh, defendants have have. Uh, argued um, at points, I'm not finding the specific point in their briefs, um, but that they have not had the opportunity to uh, force the superintendent to comply with the RAINS Act uh, because the superintendent has not submitted any scope statements to the governor for the governor to act on. And implicit in that assertion is their belief and assumption that the superintendent has an existing current legal obligation to do so and is in violation of the law. They you know, present this argument as if they you know, can't do anything about it, but that, that's their position. And again, that undermines the constitutional authority of the superintendent. And under the Uniform Declaratory Judgment Act, he's entitled to the request the uh, supplemental relief, and, and the coin plaintiffs are entitled to uh, supplemental relief to clarify that, that uh, uh, the injunction remains in place, that it was not uh, affected by Act 57, and that the defendants must uh, continue to um, respect the superintendent's constitutional authority to engage in rulemaking without requiring uh, the governor's permission to do so. And one, one last point, if I may. Um, my understanding of 80604 sub 8 is that it is on uh, the non-moving party to show cause as to why uh, supplemental relief is not appropriate. And uh, hypothetically, if the defendants came out uh, today and said uh, the governor has no intent uh, of violating the original injunction moving forward and uh, the RAINS Act does not affect the injunction moving forward, perhaps that would be a sufficient cause to deny supplemental relief, but I have not seen any indication in the briefing thus far uh, that would indicate the governor's position to continue to comply with the injunction. And so without that uh, showing of cause, I, I don't see grounds to deny the requested supplemental relief. 
effectively, it's, it's... You think if, if they don't make that statement, it's an abuse of discretion for me not to grant your relief? I'm simply saying the burden is on the defendant uh, to demonstrate that the requested supplemental relief uh, would be inappropriate. And I don't want to make the argument for them, but I, I can't find any cause in the briefing uh, to demonstrate why supplemental relief is inappropriate. Well, they're going to be Mr. Barber or Mr. Lenny. Mr. Barber, Barber is uh, the governor or any of the defendants uh, intend to violate the injunction or the declaration that uh, has been established in this case? No, and what the problem here is really we're conflating two separate things. Um, what they're trying to do is take a dispute over representation in the Koshki matter and bring it into this case. And from what I'm hearing, it almost sounds like they want to somehow have this court enjoin the state from being able to take the position it wants to take in the Koshki matter. Um, there is no dispute that, that the court's injunction is in place. It was affirmed. There's been no decision doing anything with it. However, um, the only statements they've provided in, is in terms of what position the state may take in the Koshki matter. Um, and the bottom line is that the relief they seek is just not necessary and proper. Um, as the court said, there's, there's no evidence that there is any sort of threat to violate the injunction. Um, I, I know that they argue that they don't have to show an imminent threat, but they, they, the statute does require a showing that the relief is necessary and proper. Or um, proper. Or, or, or proper. And, um, and, and this gets into the rightness argument, is that what we have here is just an abstract disagreement. I'm referring to the, the case Olson Town of Cottage Grove. Um, even in the declaratory judgment action, which understand that the standard for rightness is much lower than in the regular action, but even there, it has to be more than just an abstract disagreement. And that's really what you have here. You, you have... Um, what is in essence political speech that they're seeking to enjoin without any sort of concrete um, dispute before this court. I'd also like to point out uh, on that point that I have heard absolutely no argument and seen no argument um, for basis of any relief as a Secretary Netzel. Given the superintendent's concessions that the new provisions under the Reigns Act amendments are not unconstitutional or problematic, and I think everyone agrees that the, the um, provision that was problematic was removed by Section 10 of the Reigns Act. At a minimum, there's no basis for relief against the Secretary. So then moving over to, to the governors, as I, I think you know, the court indicated here, that um, there, is, there are no grounds uh, to grant uh, the petition. There is no threat um, that the injunction is going to be violated um, in, until a court says otherwise it's there. But the state uh, retains the right to argue in Kashi, if, if that's the position that, that the Reigns Act has superseded. But taking that position, unless what they're trying to do is prevent us from, from arguing that, but again, that case is not before the court. <laughs> um, and, and really what we have here is a couple statements and emails and newspaper articles. I just don't think that's a sufficient showing that, that relief is necessary or proper. Um, the court has already indicated that it's, it, um, it's not... Uh, does not agree with the jurisdictional argument. Uh, we'll stand on our argument in the brief. And I well, let me ask you this. If, in fact, there was a statement uh, by uh, Governor Walker that he was going to um, uh, take action uh, to uh, violate the injunction, I would have jurisdiction to, to have a uh, supplemental order uh, that would uh, protect the declaratory judgment, wouldn't I, or the injunction? We agree that, that the court has jurisdiction to remedy violations of the injunction. It's our position that the Reigns Act amendments, that's a new dispute. And that the court doesn't have jurisdiction to consider that new dispute. But until the injunction or the declaration are vacated by the Supreme Court based upon the Reigns Act, they remain in effect. No disagreement on that. And the governor, uh, the secretary, or anybody else has no intention of violating. Is that right? That's my understanding. And there has been no attempt so far to violate. That's my understanding, and, and I don't even think it's possible for them to do it, given that um, the secretary, or given that the superintendent is not submitting the 
statements of scope. And I believe in the material submitted in the Koshki case that they, they, the department has actually indicated that we don't have to comply with the Range Act under COIN. So there's, even if, not at all conceding it, but it, it's just, it's, it's, it's not a right dispute because there's no basis, there's no way the injunction could be violated at this point. But if there is some right dispute that where the governor or any other respondents, defendants, in this case, um, take affirmative steps to violate either the declaration by Judge Smith or the uh, injunction by Judge Smith, I could step in and uh, render relief that is appropriate to deal with that threat. If there was some concrete action, if, if you know, if there was some sort of executive action, I don't know what that would be, but something beyond mere mere speech of what we think the law is or what we think the law should be. Um, again, we do not dispute that the court would have jurisdiction to remedy a violation of the injunction. What, what we argue is the court doesn't have jurisdiction to rule on the effect of the Reigns Act on Chapter 227. I, that's a kind of splitting hairs, I understand, but I, I do think that's a significant distinction. Uh, in terms of what, what, we're, what we're claiming here. Um, but that also flows into our argument that the relief they seek here is beyond the scope, um, again, because it's not necessary and proper. We have a new dispute, um, and whether, whether they're right or um, the state's rights in, in terms of uh, what effect those amendments have, it's construed a new statutory scheme, and that's not, this is not the venue to do that. Ms. Crawford. Um, well, a couple of things. One is the the Koshki petition um, is the defendant's arguments uh, about Koshki and their interest in, as they just conceded, taking a position in that case that the Reigns Act uh, blows up the injunction and that uh, now the superintendent has to comply with uh, all of the provisions of Chapter 227, uh, pursuant to uh, the, or, um, due to the amendments under under Act 57, Koshki is not a case yet. Right. It is merely a petition. The Supreme Court has not taken up uh, the petition. It has not um, uh, assumed jurisdiction over the matter. It is um, it is just sitting out there. So for the defendant to uh, try to present this as a, um, to imply that action by this court would be um, uh, trying to take away an issue from the Wisconsin Supreme Court that is pending is just not accurate. That's, that's, that's not what the procedural status is. Um, with respect to their arguments about uh, political speech, uh, if this court uh, grants the relief requested, um, which would be a court uh, addressing the legal issue about whether Act 57 changes any of the provisions that are affected by the injunction previously issued in the case, they can continue their political speech if they want, arguing that, in their view, uh, the superintendent uh, ought to comply with the Reigns Act, but uh, Superintendent Evers uh, would have the um, uh, relief from uncertainty uh, from having a court of law, uh, which is the uh, decision maker in, in these kinds of disputes, um, stating that uh, uh, he was in fact uh, following the law. So the, um, there is, is nothing improper about the court uh, getting involved and resolving the legal issue of, of statutory construction that is, is presented by the petitioners in their request for supplemental relief. And uh, the, the petitioners and the superintendent do not have to wait for uh, a violation of the injunction to be entitled uh, to the relief that they are seeking. Uh, I, I would um, just add once again that uh, the governor and Secretary Nitzel have made no attempt before this court to show uh, cause as to why the request of relief should not be granted. They have not um, attempted to explain why it is or how it is that Act 57 changed the statutory provisions that are enjoined under COIN 
uh, in such a way that the um, the superintendent is now uh, required to comply with all of the uh, Chapter 227 proceedings. Well, do they have to address the merits, or can't they just simply demonstrate that there's nothing that needs to be done here? Isn't well, that sufficient to show I, laws why I shouldn't be issuing uh, supplemental relief? Mm -hmm. I, well, I, I am arguing in the alternative, Your Honor. Okay. First is that uh, we have demonstrated that um, the supplemental relief that's requested is necessary or proper because uh, the state's, uh, uh, to the state's uh, highest executive officers are out there accusing the superintendent of public construction of violating state law in a way that undermines his constitutional authority to supervise the um, system of public education in this state. He is, um, it is necessary and it is proper for the court to uh, weigh in and to uh, issue a, a declaratory ruling uh, supplemental to the declaratory ruling already in place that in fact Act 57 does not uh, affect that injunction. Uh, so again, there's just nothing in the law, no case cited, no, um, no principle stating that for the court to grant supplemental relief under 806 of uh, 048, um, that uh, a violation of the um, previous order is uh, imminent or has already happened. And the, the, some of the court's questions suggest that the superintendent has to wait for a violation to no, I happen. Don't, I, and I didn't mean to convey that, but there has to be some credible, it doesn't even have to be imminent, but there has to be some basis for me to conclude that this injunction or this declaration are going to be violated. Mm -hmm. Not that they're going to take a different position, or a, or the, a contrary position, in a different lawsuit involving a different um, statute involving a different form, but that this specific injunction and this specific declaration are threatened in some manner. I don't see any other way to interpret um, Walker's and Attorney General Schimmel's uh, statements, their public statements. Um, the a representative for Attorney General Schimmel, David Meany, he's the, I believe, the Administrator of Legal Services, stated in an email to the Chief Legal Counsel for DPI that the RAINS Act applies to DPI's ruling and that this is the only correct position the state can take. In that litigation before the Wisconsin Supreme Court? In whatever context, in whatever context. And likewise, the superintendent of, or the, uh, excuse me, the governor's spokesperson said that um, there is no legal basis to avoid the conclusion that the RAINS Act applies to reverse rulemaking. We don't know at this point if the Supreme Court is going to take up that petition or not. The fact that it's been sitting out there for two and a half months suggests that it's not going to take it up. So if this court grants the supplemental relief, the state could in turn appeal that if it wished to. And, and So you still don't get certainty that you want. Well, I, if nothing the, I'm going to do is going to give certainty to any of this. That, well, the, that's always the case in the court system, right? That there is a, a right to um, exhaust available appeals. So I'm just saying there's more than one way for uh, this case to end up in, in the state's highest court. And given the fact that the state Supreme Court has shown no signs of, of taking it up, um, you know, this court could certainly resolve that issue by exercising the jurisdiction which it now has. There's no conflict, there's no comedy issue. Um, and uh, uh, making a determination that uh, the provisions of Act 57 doesn't affect the provisions that are enjoined under uh, the coin decision. And, um, you know, as I said, if, if uh, Governor Walker and Secretary Meisel wanted to appeal that decision, they could certainly do so. Ultimately, um, you know, bring it to either the Court of Appeals or the, the Supreme Court, but there is nothing, there, there's nothing uh, pending in the Supreme Court, and this the state or the Attorney General and Walker have, have made it very clear what their position is in this. They believe that the Reigns Act currently uh, requires the superintendent to uh, submit 
scope statements and proposed rules to the governor and that the superintendent is in violation of the law to the extent that he's not doing that. Um, I also just, just uh, want to clarify one little piece on the timeline, which is that the um, uh, Act 57 itself was published on August 10th. Uh, the current uh, administrative rulemaking that is um, pending in the department, I believe, was initiated before that. Uh, um, uh, DPS Council can correct me on that, but it was initiated before uh, the Act 57 was published. So the scope statement uh, was published before Act 57 came into effect and um, is now, the, ultimately, there will be. Um, a final proposed rule that is submitted to the legislature. And the governor's position, as stated by his spokesperson, and the attorney general's position, uh, as stated by his spokesperson, is that the Rains Act applies, and the superintendent ought to have to submit those rules to the governor instead of to the legislature. And that's the problem we have here. We have an active rulemaking happening. I'd like to add, um, the case cited uh, by both parties, all parties, uh, Morris v. Ellis, uh, did consider this um, issue as to whether or not there is a controversy that can be adjudicated and, uh, and issued declaratory relief. Um, uh, Morris v. Ellis 221 was uh, 307, uh, pages 923 to 924. Uh, the court considered two objections on the grounds uh, against uh, declaratory relief on the grounds that no controversy over the obligation um, exists. And the court in that case said, if this is true, no prejudice can result from the adjudication of this undisputed obligation. So in this context, um, I see- well, that, that has been uh, uh, departed from in a number of cases since Morris. I mean, if, if there's nothing to adjudicate, the Court of Appeals has made it very clear to me that I'm not to adjudicate. Right, so... And it, they reverse me even when I'm right. <laughs> and, so in this matter, um, I suppose if there is no dispute, if there is uh, no controversy over whether or not the injunction is in full force, uh, then I suppose we can we can all wait until if and when there is a dispute. However, the defendant, uh, the uh, the governor's response in the briefing in public comments, uh, in every chance that they have um, to respond to the request for supplemental relief has been uh, there is a new law, the Rains Act, which suppl uh, supplants the old law. Uh, these requested supplemental relief, as I understand it, is fairly narrow. Uh, it is asking to reaffirm the current injunction is in place and that injunction continues uh, even uh, with the passage of uh, Act 57. I think that's where the focus of our briefing has been in that all that we're asking is for the original injunction uh, which did uh, resolve a dispute, a controversy um, in, between the governor and the DPI and the uh, plaintiffs, that that continues to be in effect even though uh, there has been uh, subsequent legislation that um, made certain amendments that were immaterial to the uh, original injunction. May I respond to a couple points? That's not even inconsistent with your position, is it? The injunction and the declaration remain in place until the Supreme Court changes. Correct. All right, go ahead. The burden argument. I look at the burden argument the, the, the same, similarly to, to summary judgment. You can win by saying, here's all my evidence, I win, or here's their stuff, and it's not legally sufficient. And that's what we have here. What they've submitted in their petition is not legally sufficient to grant the relief that's being requested. Um, all, the all the comments about rulemaking are nice, but there's been no, they didn't submit any record on that. So I, you, you really don't have a way to respond to that. That's not an evidence. Um, dispute that the um, relief sought is, is narrow. Uh, again, they have, they have not responded to why it's necessary for Secretary Knights at all, um, nor is there any reason it's necessary for all state employees. Um, and again, it's just our position that this is not the proper forum to adjudicate what effect, if any, the Rains Act has. Um, on the 
has on the constitutionality of the, the uh, Chapter 227 rulemaking. But if you don't have any other questions, Your Honor, that's, that's all we have. I just like to briefly respond to that. If the Supreme Court, as a matter of original action, has jurisdiction to take up that controversy over whether Act 57 changes the, the previous injunction issued in coin at all, then certainly this court, uh, which was the original grant whore of that injunction, does as well. That is not that case is not before the Supreme Court on any kind of appeal. It was presented as an original action um, in in. In such cases, the Circuit Court and the Supreme Court uh, stand on equal footing in terms of exercising jurisdiction. Um, and Boy, the like Supreme Court that. can grant or deny that petition. If they were to grant, if they were to grant the petition today, that would take jurisdiction out of this court, and it would be in the Wisconsin Supreme Court. They haven't done so. So, you know, the, when the when the Supreme Court is act, exercising original action jurisdiction, um, it's, it, it's in no different position than, than the circuit court in terms of a live dispute and the, the, a ripe dispute. The, all of the, all of the uh, uh, arguments that uh, Governor Walker and, and Secretary Neitzel have presented today are just stating that their preference would be a different forum. They would rather take those arguments to the Wisconsin Supreme Court. That's not a reason for this court to decline its jurisdiction here. It has jurisdiction over this matter, and it could certainly exercise it. All right. Um, well, I view my role in this case as only the protection of the declaration and the injunction that was that were. Um, entered by Judge Smith, affirmed by the Court of Appeals, and affirmed uh, uh, by the Supreme Court um, some time ago. The statute that uh, is operative is you know, 604 sub 8, which is uh, designed, I believe, to uh, enhance this court's ability to protect declarations and uh, uh, other um, relief attendant to declarations that have been previously made. And the um, section reads that further relief, the section's entitled Supplemental Relief, but it reads further relief based on a declaratory judgment or decree may be granted whenever necessary or proper. The application, therefore, shall be by petition to a court having jurisdiction to grant the relief. If the application be deemed sufficient, the court shall, on reasonable notice, require any adverse party whose rights have been adjudicated by the declaratory judgment or decree to show cause why further relief should not be granted forthwith. The analysis, as I see it, is not all that uh, complicated, convoluted, or difficult. Uh, the petition uh, for supplemental relief is denied because uh, there has been a showing by the defense that there is cause why it should not be granted and the cause is within all of the materials that have been submitted to the court and the bottom line is this there's nothing that needs to be done um, there is no um, there has been no violation of either the injunction or the declaration there is no um, opportunity by which uh, the defendants can violate the injunction and declaration currently. There is no stated intention to violate the injunction or declaration. There is, of course, the statement by the governor and uh, by the uh, attorney general that they believe the RAINS Act changes uh, the law upon which the declaration and injunction were issued. And that is certainly their prerogative to um, state and to um, uh, advocate. But until there is some, some basis to conclude that the declaration by Judge Smith or the injunction by Judge Smith attendant to that declaration uh, is in some way threatened um, by the actions of the governor or any of the defendants, there is no reason for this court to grant any kind of relief. The injunction stands, the declaration stands, 
it is be, they are both being abided by, and they uh, neither one of them uh, is currently um, uh, in threat of being violated in any respect. What we have is an entirely separate action. Uh, the original action um, petition, it's not an action, you're correct, uh, Ms. Crawford. Uh, it really is of no uh, uh, influence on what I'm doing here because the Supreme Court is going to do what they want or not want, irrespective of what I rule here today. I do think it would be short-sighted to take an original action, but so what? They don't care what I think about that. They may or may not take it. I don't think the fact that they haven't taken it yet means anything, frankly. Um, and I would be happy to debate with you sometime, Ms. Crawford, whether or not I stand on equal footing with the Supreme Court in terms of jurisdiction uh, to render further relief on uh, the RAINS Act insofar as it affects the uh, um, injunction entered uh, by Judge Smith and her declaration. I'm telling you I have no concern about my jurisdiction to protect the declaration and injunction pursuant to 80604 sub uh, 8. I have no concern about the passage of time as infecting that ability to do that. What I'm telling you is that nothing needs to be done or has been shown needs to be done uh, at this point to protect either with supplemental relief. And so I do not believe that further relief based upon the declaratory judgment should be granted here because it is neither necessary nor proper at this point. Uh, Mr. Uh, Barbara, you may draft an order to that effect, please. For the reasons stated, the petition is denied. We don't need to go any further than that. Anything further today? Thank you for your excellent briefs and arguments. We are adjourned.